So here we're going to continue on with the respiratory system. Now we're going to be looking at what's going on between the blood vessels and the tissues for moving the gases. So this is Dalton's law, looks at the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. This is going to be between the blood and the alveolar air. That air is going to depend on the partial pressure of the gases. You have diffusion of the molecules between the gas and the liquid. So each gas in the mixture is going to exert its own pressure as if the other ones weren't present. So when we look at this, the total pressure is the sum of all of the partial pressures. So your total pressure is atmospheric pressure at sea level 760 millimeters of mercury. That 760 millimeters of mercury is made up of the pressure of oxygen, pressure of carbon dioxide, pressure of nitrogen, pressure of water, and then there is a small fraction that's other gases. So to determine the partial pressure of oxygen, you have to multiply that 760 by what percentage of the air is actually oxygen, which is about 21%. So the pressure of oxygen comes out to be 160 millimeters of mercury. So when we look at air, it's 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, and 0.04% carbon dioxide. When we look at alveolar air, it's 14% oxygen, 79% oxygen, 5.2% carbon dioxide. Expired air is 16% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, and 4.5% carbon dioxide. So there is a bit of a mystery to this that we don't exactly have a great explanation for. The alveolar air has less oxygen since it's absorbed by the blood. So the mystery here is the expired air has more oxygen and less carbon dioxide than the alveolar air. But the good news is it does allow CPR to work that we can use that expired air to ventilate a person. So the anatomical dead space, it's 150 milliliters of the 500 milliliters of the tidal volume. So Henry's law states that when gas is under pressure, it comes in contact with the liquid, the gas dissolves in the liquid until it reaches equilibrium. So at a given temperature, the amount of gas in a solution is proportional to the partial pressures. So the actual amount of gas in a solution at a given partial pressure and temperature depends on the solubility of the gas in that particular liquid. So carbon dioxide is very soluble, oxygen is less soluble, and nitrogen has very low solubility. So this is looking at your increased air pressure. This is when it's at equilibrium and just comparing it to an unopened soda can. So when you remove the lid, now you've got a decrease in pressure and you reach a new e equilibrium. So just like when you open the soda, soda can, you're gonna have some of the pressure dissipate out till it reaches a new equilibrium when it's just sitting there. So looking at the gas content in the blood, with Henry's law, it basically says the amount of gas dissolved in a solution depends on its temperature. So if it's a higher temperature, you have less dissolved. The gas solubility, this is a constant for each gas. And then the partial pressure of the gas in the air in which the solution is e at equilibrium. So the concentration of a gas in a solution is gonna be proportional to the partial pressures of the gas. So looking at diffusion in the respiratory membrane, the direction and rate of diffusion of gases across the respiratory membrane will determine the different partial pressures and solubilities. So we have the efficiency of gas exchange due to there is substantial different partial pressures across the respiratory membrane. It's just a small distance involved in gas exchange. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are lipid soluble. There's a large total surface area. Blood flow and airflow are coordinated. Oxygen is a smaller molecule that will diffuse somewhat faster. Carbon dioxide dissolves 24 times more easily in water. So there's a net 
outward diffusion of carbon dioxide that's faster. So disease will produce hypoxia before it produces hypercapnia. That you have a lack of oxygen before you have too much carbon dioxide. So we can look at respiratory process with partial pressures here. In normal partial pressures in the pulmonary vein and plasma, the pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters of mercury. Of oxygen is 100 millimeters of mercury and nitrogen is 573. Oxygenated blood is going to mix with deoxygenated blood from the conducting pathways. This lowers the pressure of the oxygen in the blood entering the systemic circuit. So it goes down to about 95 millimeters of mercury. So here's looking at your systemic circuit here with your external respiration the respiratory membrane, oxygen's moving into the bloodstream, carbon dioxide is moving out. This is so you can exhale the carbon dioxide. If you look at the systemic circulation down here with internal respiration, you've got carbon dioxide going into the bloodstream and oxygen going into the tissues. So this again is going to let you see where you transport oxygen and carbon dioxide, what is moving in what direction. Down here you've got the tissue in the interstitial fluid. So when you are in the alveolar sacs, you're going to have carbon dioxide moving in to the alveoli oxygen moving into the bloodstream. When you're at the tissue, you've got oxygen moving into the tissue, carbon dioxide moving into the bloodstream. So internal respiration, you've got the exchange of gases between the blood and the tissues, the conversion of oxygenated blood into deoxygenated blood. So what you're going to see is a diffusion of oxygen inward. At rest, 25% of the available oxygen enters the cells. During exercise, you're going to absorb more of it. You'll also observe diffusion of carbon dioxide outward. So again, this is giving you that comparison, moving carbon dioxide to exhale into the alveoli, oxygen into the blood to be transported, and then in the tissues, Oxygen is going to go from the blood to the tissues, and then carbon dioxide from the tissues into the blood. So this is going to give you a comparison of these different things happening in the different places. So your alveolar pressure is relatively high for oxygen, for carbon dioxide, it's relatively low as you go between the alveolar sacs and the blood vessels. So in contrast, the systemic venous blood entering the lungs is relatively low in oxygen, high in carbon dioxide, because it's given up oxygen and picked up carbon dioxide in the capillaries. So this is going to give you your partial pressure gradient between the alveolar air and the pulmonary capillary blood. That's going to lead to your passive diffusion of oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide out of the blood. So the blood leaves the lungs. It's going to be high in oxygen, low in carbon dioxide. And then when you get down here to the systemic circulation, you're going to have things be reversed in here. So here it's going to favor the movement of the oxygen out of the blood into the cells and the carbon dioxide from the cells into the blood. So oxygen transport 
In each 100 milliliters of oxygenated blood, 1.5% of the oxygen is dissolved in the plasma. 98.5% is on the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells. So most of it travels on the hemoglobin, the vast majority. So your hemoglobin is going to have the globin protein in a pigment called heme. The heme has four atoms of iron. Each is able to combine with oxygen. So the most important factor that determines how much oxygen combines with the hemoglobin is the pressure of the oxygen. The greater the pressure of the oxygen, the more oxygen will combine with hemoglobin. And it will do this with the available hemoglobin until it's all saturated. So in order for hemoglobin to be a good vehicle to transport oxygen, it's got to be able to pick it up in the lungs and release it in the tissues. So it has to go between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. So the blood is almost fully saturated when the pressure of oxygen gets to be about 60 millimeters of mercury. So this does allow people to be at high altitudes and to survive with some diseases. Between 40 and 20 millimeters of mercury, you have large amounts of oxygen that are released in areas that need it like contracting muscle. So this shows you the percent saturation of the hemoglobin and the different pressures that correlate with it. So here what you see with contracting skeletal muscle, the average at rest, and in the systemic arteries. So oxygen transport in the blood being that 98.5% of it is chemically combined. That's how the vast majority is going to be transported. It does not dissolve easily in water, so only 1.5% is transported in the blood. Only dissolved oxygen can diffuse into the tissues. So factors that will affect the dissociation of oxygen from the hemoglobin are important. So we have your oxygen dissociation curve. If you have an acidic environment, oxygen splits more readily from the hemoglobin. We call that the Bohr effect. If you have a low blood pH or acidic conditions, it can result from having high carbon dioxide. So within limits, as the temperature increases, so does the amount of oxygen that's released from the hemoglobin. So this works out well because active cells require more oxygen and an active cell is going to have a warmer temperature. So this will allow you to liberate more acid and heat. And that in turn stimulates the oxyhemoglobin to release its oxygen. So the 2,3-biphosphoglycerate, it's a substance that's formed in the red blood cells during glycolysis. The greater the level of BPG, the more oxygen is released from hemoglobin. So when the cells are doing that type of metabolism, you're going to produce more of this substance. That's going to give you oxygen to be able to do more of the metabolism more efficiently. So here, if we look at acidity and oxygen affinity for hemoglobin, as your acidity increases, the oxygen affinity is going to decrease for hemoglobin. We call it the Bohr effect. So the hydrogen ion binds to the hemoglobin and alters it. That's the reason for it. So the oxygen gets left behind in the needy tissues. So here you can see comparison in the blood between 7.6, 7.4, and 7.2 what the percent saturation of hemoglobin is. So as the pressure of carbon dioxide rises with exercise, oxygen is going to be more readily released. The carbon dioxide converts to carbonic acid, and that's going to create that hydrogen ion with the bicarbonate ions that lowers the pH. So again, you can see the pressure of carbon dioxide in low blood levels, normal blood levels, and high blood carbon dioxide, so you can make a comparison. So as temperature increases, more oxygen is released. You have more metabolic activity and heat, more BPG, more oxygen released. 
So that allows for more red blood cell activities and the actions of hormones like thyroxine and growth hormone. So here you can look at the percent saturation of hemoglobin and temperature. So comparing at 20 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Celsius, 43 degrees Celsius. Oxygen and fetal hemoglobin. We've got some changes here. This is different from the adults. So when the pressure of oxygen is low, it can carry more oxygen. The maternal blood in the placenta has less oxygen. So here you can see there is this slight difference in the saturation between maternal and fetal hemoglobin. For carbon dioxide transport, it's going to be carried in the blood in the form of dissolved carbon dioxide. So you can have up to 7% dissolved here. Carbaminohemoglobin, 23%, and bicarbonate ion is 70%. So carbon dioxide gets transported very differently from the blood. The conversion of carbon dioxide to bicarbonate and the related chloride shift is going to maintain the ionic balance between the plasma and the red blood cells. So when you look, carbon dioxide diffuses into the bloodstream. 7% remains in the plasma. 93% goes into the red blood cells. Of that, 23% binds to the hemoglobin. 70% is converted here by carbonic anhydrase into your bicarbonate. And that will allow you to have the dissociation to make the hydrogen ion that hydrogen ion gets removed by buffers, especially hemoglobin. And that's going to cause this to move out in exchange for the chloride shift. So if you're wondering what the chloride shift is, it's because of what is being absorbed into the bloodstream of the bicarbonate and what has to what ion has to move to offset it. This picture is a good explanation of that. And again, this is showing what is going on with the carbon dioxide and blood at the different tissue and alveolar places. So this again does a comparison of what's going in and out in the alveolus into the red blood cell and then from the red blood cell into the tissues. So controlling respiration, you've got to keep all of these delicate balances in check. You have gas perfusion at the peripheral and alveolar capillaries that gets maintained by changes in the blood flow and oxygen delivery, as well as changes in the depth and rate of respiration. So we've got our medullary rhythmicity area that is part of the respiratory center and you're gonna have inspiratory and expiratory areas. So you've got the pneumotaxic area and the apneustic area. This lets you see where these different areas are here in the brainstem. So that's one of the reasons why brainstem injuries can cause a person not to be able to regulate their breathing. So this is going to show you, you have the phrenic nerve that's going to go to the diaphragm and that going into the medulla oblongata. You have the intercostal nerves that are going to go to the internal and intercostal muscles. And then you've got these different areas of your medullary respiratory centers. So the dorsal respiratory group, the ventral respiratory group, So the medullary rhythmicity center is going to control your basic rhythm of respiration. The inspiratory area has an intrinsic excitability of autorhythmic neurons. This is going to set your basic rhythm of respiration. So this is why you're able to continue breathing without consciously remembering to do this. Inspiration goes for two seconds, expiration for three. The autorhythmic cells are active for two seconds and then they're inactive. 
So the expiratory neurons are inactive most of the time during quiet breathing. You're only going to kick this in during high ventilation rates. So for the inspiratory area, you got two seconds telling the diaphragm and the external intercostals to contract. And then three seconds where the diaphragm and intercostals relax, followed by elastic recoil of the chest and lungs. So the inspiratory area can activate the diaphragm, the SCM, and the scalene muscles to contract to force air in. The expiratory area can have the intercostals and abdominal muscles contract to force air out. So the pneumotaxic and apneustic areas. The pneumotaxic area is going to have constant inhibitory impulses to the inspiratory area. The neurons are trying to turn off inspiration before the lungs get too expanded. The apneustic area is going to signal to the inspiratory area to prolong inspiration. So it can be a problem if the pneumotaxic area is sick. These areas need to be balanced to keep the time inhaling and exhaling balanced. So regulation of this, what's going to influence this? You can have cortical influences to voluntarily alter your breathing patterns. So you can have conscious control of respiration so that you can avoid inhaling noxious gases. You go into a stinky honey bucket, you can hold your breath while you're in there. That's one of the advantages of having cortical influence. However, the voluntary breath holding is going to be limited by the overriding of stimuli. So if you hold your breath too long, it will take that privilege away from you and it's going to force you to start to breathe. Carbon dioxide inspiratory center is going to be stimulated by increases in either. So what happens if you have held your breath too long and it takes that away from you, you're going to faint and then your normal breathing is going to resume. So honey bucket's probably not the area you want to hold your breath too long and faint. There isn't really a good place to fall when you faint in one of those. So this is showing here the different influences that are inputs into the respiratory centers of the medulla oblongata, higher brain center, chemoreceptors, carotid and aortic bodies, stretch reflexes in there, proprioceptors, touch, temperature, pain, stimuli are all going to have influences and then send information back out. So looking at the chemoregulation, if you have a slight increase in the pressure of carbon dioxide and therefore the hydrogen ion, we call it hypercapnia, this stimulates the chemoreceptors. So as a response to increased pressure of carbon dioxide, you're going to increase the hydrogen ion and the pressure of the oxygen. The inspiratory area will become activated and lead to hyperventilation. So you would have rapid and deep breathing occur. If the arterial pressure of carbon dioxide is lower than 40 millimeters of mercury, we call it hypocapnia. The chemoreceptors are not stimulated, and so the inspiratory area ends up setting its own pace until carbon dioxide accumulates and raises up to 40 millimeters of mercury. Severe deficiency of oxygen will depress the activity of the central chemoreceptors and respiratory centers. So those central chemoreceptors in the medulla, they're going to respond to changes in the hydrogen ion or the pressure of carbon dioxide. So hypercapnia is a slight increase in the pressure of carbon dioxide. The peripheral receptors are going to respond to changes in the hydrogen ion and the pressure of oxygen or carbon dioxide. They're located in the aortic body in the wall of the aorta. So this joins the vagus and carotid bodies in the walls of the common carotid arteries and it joins the glossopharyngeal nerve. So we have negative feedback providing regulation of breathing it's going to be influenced by the arterial pressure of carbon dioxide. It stimulates the receptors. You've got the inspiratory centers, the muscles of the respiratory system. The respiration muscles will contract more frequently and more forcefully, and carbon dioxide decreases. So this again here is just going to show how you've got this negative feedback loop. 
that is going to be influenced. You've got your arterial pressure of carbon dioxide increasing, decreasing the pH and pressure of oxygen, the receptors being influenced by this, sending the information to the control center, and then the effectors are going to send the message to the muscles of inhalation and exhalation. That's going to change the pressures of carbon dioxide and oxygen and ultimately provide the negative feedback that's needed to maintain homeostasis. So what I would recommend as you go through and do this, try to just understand the pressure of one of these at a time in the different locations and try and kind of get it in your mind that way. And then I would go and study by location, specifically what is going on. So you're breaking it down in a couple different ways to try and just let it make sense in your brain. It does all make sense. It's just sometimes a little overwhelming getting all the little pieces together. So the control of the respiratory rate, your proprioceptors in your joints are going to activate the inspiratory center to increase ventilation prior to exercise. It knows you're going to need more oxygen and you're going to need it immediately. The inflation reflex is going to detect lung expansion with stretch receptors and it limits it depending on the ventilatory needs and the prevention of damage. Other things that are going to influence this blood pressure, the limbic system, temperature, pain, stretching of the anal sphincter, and irritation to the respiratory mucosa. So this is a nice picture that's going to look at ventilation rate with depth, things that are going to increase the ventilation rate, voluntary hyperventilation, anticipating activity, increase in arterial blood hydrogen levels or carbon dioxide in there, increase in sensory stimuli from proprioceptors, decrease in blood pressure, increase in body temperature, prolonged pain, and stretching the anal sphincter things that are going to have the ventilation rate and depth decrease, hypoventilation, decrease in the arterial blood hydrogen levels or carbon dioxide, decrease in sensory impulses from the proprioceptors, increase blood pressure from baroreceptors, decrease body temperature. Severe pain can cause apnea. So if you think about what happened the last time you stubbed your toe on something is you brought, briefly held your breath. And then irritation of the pharynx or larynx. So for coughing and sneezing. Hypoxia refers to oxygen deficiency at the tissue level. So we can classify it different ways. So hypoxic hypoxia is caused by low pressure of the oxygen in the arterial blood. So things that can cause this being at a high altitude, airway obstruction, or fluid in the lungs. With anemic hypoxia, there's too little functioning hemoglobin. So you're just not able to carry it. This can be due to hemorrhage, anemia, carbon monoxide poisoning. With stagnant hypoxia, it's the inability of the blood to carry the oxygen to the tissues fast enough. So something in the pump and transport system is not working here. Heart failure, circulatory shock. Histotoxic hypoxia, the blood delivers adequate oxygen to the tissues, but the tissues can't use it properly. That's what happens with cyanide poisoning. You're getting plenty of oxygen, but the tissues just can't use it. You look at exercise in the respiratory system, it's tied in with the cardiovascular system. So when you exercise, it allows appropriate adjustments to happen for different exercise intensities and duration. So as the blood flow increases with a lower oxygen and higher carbon dioxide content, the amount passing through the lungs for pulmonary perfusion is going to increase, and you're going to increase the ventilation and oxygen diffusion capacity more as those capillaries open. So these ventilatory modifications can increase 30 times above resting levels, so it can be a big change. So you have an initial rapid rate due to the neural influences, and then it's more gradually from the chemical stimulation that comes afterwards. So a similar but reversed effect happens when you stop the exercise. 
So smokers have difficulty breathing for a number of reasons, including the nicotine, mucus, irritants, and then you're going to have more scar tissue that replaces some of the elastic fibers, so they won't work as well. So smokers are more easily winded with moderate exercise. The nicotine constricts the terminal bronchioles. Carbon monoxide binds up the hemoglobin. Irritants in the smoke can cause excess mucus secretion. Those irritants can inhibit movement of the cilia. Over time, you destroy elastic fibers that can lead to emphysema. And you have trapping of the air in the alveoli, so you have reduced gas exchange. Plus, you can see where you have the remnants of things from the cigarette smoke in the lungs versus the coloring of a normal healthy lung. Pneumothorax, here the pleural cavities are sealed when they're not open to the outside. That's a normal thing. But when you have an injury to the chest wall, it lets air into that intrapleural space. That intrapleural space then can have a pneumothorax occur because the lung will collapse on the same side as the injury. You no longer have the surface tension and recoil of the elastic fibers holding it together. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So these can be exemplified by chronic bronchitis and obstructive emphysema. Most of these patients are going to have a history of smoking. Dyspnea, where you have labored breathing and it gets progressively worse. And coughing and frequent pulmonary infections. So they can develop respiratory failure accompanied by hypoxemia, carbon dioxide retention, and respiratory acidosis. So you can see in the picture of this man here, he tends to have kind of a barrel-shaped chest. That's one of the features that can be seen with somebody who's had chronic COPD, is they become barrel-chested. So the progressive airflow limitations can cause an abnormal inflammatory reaction. You can have chronic bronchitis and emphysema contribute to this. So signs of the COPD are actually, you can have anatomical changes, the barrel chested. You'll see purse breathing, productive cough, cyanosis. So here you can also see digital clubbing that is a feature that's seen with it in the hands. So with asthma, what we see is dyspnea, wheezing, and chest tightness. There's an active inflammation process that is going to precede the bronchospasms. Then you have airway inflammation. It's an immune response that's going to be caused from IL-4 and IL-5 that stimulates the IgE. It's going to lead to more inflammation. And then the airways get thickened with inflammatory exudate that magnify the effect of the bronchospasms. So you can see here with chronic bronchitis and emphysema, both of them lead to airway obstruction, or air trapping, shortness of breath, frequent infections. Tuberculosis, or TB, this is caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So with this, symptoms include fever, night sweats, weight loss, a racking cough and a splitting headache. So this is a tough infection to kill. A lot of that is because mycobacterium is slow to grow, so it is slow to take up antibiotics that would treat it. So it's not unusual that it could be a 12-month course of antibiotics depending on how resistant your infection is. Lung cancer, so this is about a third of all cancer deaths in the US. 90% of those patients were smokers. So to Smoke definitely increases your risk of lung cancer. The three most common types, squamous cell carcinoma, it's 20 to 40% of cases that arise in the bronchial epithelium. Adenocarcinoma is 25 to 35% of cases. This is going to originate in the peripheral lung area. And then small cell carcinoma is 20 to 25%. This is going to contain lymphocyte-like cells that originate in the primary bronchi and then subsequently metastasize. So this is normal tissue inside the lung. 
with pneumonia, you've got fluid and blood cells in the alveoli, the alveolar walls are thickened by edema, you're covering the space where gas exchange occurs. With emphysema, you've got these confluent alveoli, so you don't, you've broken down a lot of the cell walls. So that increased membrane thickness and decreased surface area is going to make breathing more of an issue for these people. With your respiratory system, it's one of the last things that develops. It begins as an outgrowth of the foregut called the respiratory diverticulum. The endoderm of the diverticulum then is going to give rise to your epithelium. So this will lead to the glands of the trachea, bronchi, and alveoli. So the mesoderm portion of it is going to produce the connective tissue of the lungs, your cartilage, smooth muscle, and pleural sacs. The epithelium of the larynx is going to come from endoderm. You'll form these pharyngeal arches, and arches four and six will produce the cartilage and muscle. And then the distal ends of the respiratory diverticulum develop into tracheal blood buds that develop a little bit later. So the development timeline in six to 16 weeks, that's when the basic structures are formed. Between 16 and 26 weeks, now you've got vascularization and the development of the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar bronchioles, and some of the alveoli. At 26 weeks, you have more alveoli developed between 26 weeks and birth. By 26 to 28 weeks, there's now sufficient surfactant for survival. So for a premature infant, we do have artificial surfactant that we can give them that helps with this. But that's one of the risks to a premature infant is looking at how developed are their lungs. So you've got four weeks to get the endoderm of the foregut to give rise to the lung buds. That differentiates into the epithelial lining. At six months, you have the closed tubes swell into the alveoli of the lungs. So you can see their development is really relatively late compared to other structures during fetal development. So aging, the respiratory tissues and chest wall becomes more rigid. Your vital capacity decreases to 35% by age 70. You have a decrease in macrophage activity, decreased ciliary action, decreased blood oxygen levels. So what you end up with is an age-related susceptibility to pneumonia or bronchitis. So other disorders, we see asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. These would include emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and lung cancer, pneumonia, tuberculosis, coryza, and influenza. You can have pulmonary edema, cystic fibrosis. With pneumothorax, normally those pleural cavities are sealed, not open to the outside. You can have injury to the chest wall that lets air into that inner pleural space. So you end up with a collapsed lung on the side of the injury. Your surface tension and the recoil, the elastic fibers, is what causes it to collapse. So a lot of these disorders will result in a homeostatic imbalance. That's where the problem comes. With asthma, you can have spasms of the smooth muscle in the bronchial tubes that are going to give partial or complete closure of the air passageways, inflammation, inflated alveoli and excess mucus production. One of the more common things to trigger asthma are things that you're allergic to, but other factors could include emotional upset, aspirin, exercise and breathing in cold air or cigarette smoke. So for some people, cold air is just the main trigger for it. With chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, this is characterized by chronic and recurrent obstruction of airflow that increases the airway resistance. So your principal types, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Bronchitis is that inflammation in there. In bronchogenic carcinoma or lung cancer, the epithelial cells get replaced by cancer cells after constant irritation. So you'll have normal growth, division, and function being disrupted. 
the airways can be blocked and then metastasis is very common with these. Again, common association with smokers. Pneumonia, you have infection of the alveoli. Most common cause is pneumococcal bacteria, but other microbes can be involved. If it's bacterial, it's usually treated with antibiotics, bronchodilators, oxygen therapy, chest physiotherapy. TB, you've got your inflammation. caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. It leaves non-functional fibrous tissue behind. Coryza, your common cold. And the flu, these are viruses. They're usually not going to have a fever, but the flu can have a fever greater than 101. Pulmonary edema, you accumulate interstitial fluid in the interstitial spaces of the alveoli and the lungs. So it can be pulmonary or cardiac in origin. Cystic fibrosis, it's an inherited disease. It will affect the respiratory passageways, the pancreas, salivary glands, and sweat glands, so you have thick mucus secretions with that. Asbestos-related diseases, these are the result of inhaling asbestos particles. So these can give diffuse pleural thickening or mesothelioma that may result. So asbestos is something you want to avoid and definitely not breathe in. SIDS, the sudden infant death syndrome, it's unexpected death, but apparently healthy infant. The peak ages this happens is two to four months. We don't really know the exact cause. So SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, they are several variations of SARS that are emerging infectious diseases.